patrol officer with, with the Menominee Police Department. Um, he graduated from UW Stevens Point with a bachelor's degree in resource management and a minor in environmental law enforcement. He started working in law enforcement in 1995 and has been with the Menominee Police Department since 2000. Um, with the Menominee Police Department, he served as a field training officer, a school resource officer, and instructor, and he has also served 15 years on SWAT. Um, Aaron teaches defensive tactics, firearms, and tactical response for the Menominee Police Department. He also periodically teaches self-defense classes to the community. In his time off, Aaron enjoys um, his family and children and a variety of outdoor activities. Um, I have not met Aaron before in person, but I have seen his advertisements around the community for his self-defense classes. Um, so that's how I found him. Um, and he has a couple books that have inspired him. And I did read one um, within the last month and it was very interesting. Um, so I would recommend actually checking some of those out. But I'll let Aaron take it away and give us his information. Thank you. Um, so appreciate being uh, asked to do this. Uh, basically, this is a, a very new type of format for me to present on. So I have to apologize if I seem a little nervous. Um, I've never actually done a presentation to a webinar. Um, most of my presentations or talks are in person. Actually, all of them are until now. Um, but we wanted to talk about uh, situational awareness. And uh, so as I was thinking about this, uh, a lot of the self-defense classes I teach uh, do reference uh, or do talk about uh, and go through hands-on skills and technical techniques and things like that. Um, but we also do spend a fair amount of time talking about situational awareness. Uh, <clears throat> so oftentimes when, when I think about situational awareness or like when I, when I first think about it, I, I think back to some of my early time to, uh, in SWAT or in, in law enforcement and was always being told to keep your head on a swivel, always, uh, anticipate the worst type of, uh, instruction. And I don't necessarily think that's the best way to, to go about it. Uh, people don't live their lives very well if they're always in that constant state of, of worry or anxiety or, or readiness. I think what's better for us to, to think about is, you know, what are we doing at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, and, or what, what are we about to do? And so we, to kind of put it in a, in a frame of reference, um, something that we all do all the time going about our jobs, our personal lives is, is we drive cars. And if we think about it, driving a car is, an ex is a perfect example of situational awareness. So it's a, it's a multitask operation. You're, you're driving a vehicle, your hands are on the wheel. Uh, you're, you're thinking about where you're going. So you're navigating, you're operating this, this uh, vehicle and you have all kinds of outside stimulus that come, come at you. And most every day, you know, this is all routine stuff. We, it, we kind of get into uh, this, this habit of, of anticipating what other drivers are doing. And that's, that's part of situational awareness is, is that anticipation. When something gets thrown at us, the, you know, out of the, out of the ordinary that, that makes us, uh, uh, start to worry or build up our anxiety. And, but I would be willing to bet that 100% of you have been in a situation where you've been driving and you've looked ahead <clears throat> and a, a car suddenly pulls away from a stop sign or changes lane and right in front of you and you have to react. And, but in your mind, you think back, I knew, I knew that was gonna happen. I just knew it. And, that internal knowledge, that's intuition. And so intuition is kind of this idea of knowing without being able to articulate. So, but if you think back to the, those situations, you know, it was the way the, the way the person was coming up to the stop sign, the way their head wasn't looking in, the, in your direction, 
or the way the vehicle is starting to drift towards, uh, if they're doing a lane change maneuver, you know, there, there, were, there, there are certain things that you can actually articulate that actually um, give you that, that information and that intelligence that led to that gut feeling. So some of the things that I want to talk about now, I want to recognize these people right away because they, they like Michelle said, they, they have inspired me. I, I think they're very valuable. Uh, I am not an instructor for them. So I want to make sure that it's known that, that I'm not teaching for them. Um, and this is my interpretation of their work. So first of all, a guy named uh, Tony Blower. Uh, Tony Blower created the a defensive tactics company called uh, a Bar Tactical. Uh, he, he created a system that he has coined the Spear system. Um, so I'm going to use I'm going to reference some of his work. And uh, another uh, person that I'm going to uh, reference is a guy named Gavin De Becker. Gavin De Becker uh, wrote a book called The Gift of Fear. And if you look into Gavin's history, he uh, he's got quite a background. Um, so does Tony Barr. Um, but in the gift of fear, you will you learn a lot about how he um, discusses intuition and how we all have it. And um, there's some really good. I'll get into it a little bit later. But uh, the other per author that I want to uh, bring up is Tim Larkin. And uh, Tim Larkin wrote a book called "When Violence Is the Answer." And he's got an other material, uh, so does Gavin DeBecker. Um, but before I get into that, I want to uh, discuss a little bit um, that I use in law enforcement and, and, and I've heard elsewhere, but uh, it's called the OODA loop. And if you're familiar with the OODA loop, it's, a, it's an acronym for decision-making model. And I know there's, there's all kinds of decision-making models out there. Uh, we've got multiple in law enforcement, uh, but in the OODA loop, it stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. We observed. We observed different, uh, different people. And in, in my line of work, you know, we're going to consider them unknowns. We're going to consider them threats. We're going to consider them friendlies. Um, and so we, we observe them. And I walk, so if I walk into a room and or if I uh, use Using an example, you walk into a site and you have uh, you you observe that your surroundings. So if you're inspecting a, a kitchen or a restaurant, and you know you're looking at uh, uh, potential customers, if you're coming in during uh, business hours, you're looking at employees and owners. You also are observing the environment, and then you orientate to it. So <clears throat> you know. What do these people are to you? Are they unknowns? Are they uh, potential threats? And, and then you make decisions and you act. Uh, we all do this. And going back to the driving, you know, if you, you orientate to that person you know, who's coming up to the stop sign, or you observe it first, and then you orientate in your mind, whether you can articulate it or not, you can tell whether or not they're gonna come to a stop. And then you make a decision and you're going to continue going or you're going to start to step off the accelerator and slow yourself down because something doesn't seem right. And that's your, your action. You, that's what you end up doing. <clears throat> so the thing about the OODA loop is that we do this all the time, as do the people that we're interacting with. And for the most part, the, you know, our interactions are, are civil. They're, it's normal. Uh, it's those few rare occasions where um, you, you interact with someone hostile. And so they have their own motivations, their own uh, goals. And if it ends up being something where, where you have to take, you know, you're, you're not safe, you can disrupt their OODA loop um, and which slows them down. So the fact, you know, when we make that, that decision-making process, if everything goes as planned, it's, it's a lot faster. It's when those hiccups come in that we have to reorient, we have to reobserve, reorient, and make a new decision and take new action. So the reason this applies is um, if I go to, you know, talk about 
intuition and Gavin DeBecker, uh, his material. Um, you know, one of the examples he's, he uses in the book is, you know, you're at home and if you have this fear and worry that someone's going to crash through your window, okay, um, and, and break into your home, in that, in that scenario, that, that's all fabricated in your mind. You're making this up. It, if it's not happening at the moment, this is just a worry that you have. And then you, so with your observations, it's not really happening. You're, you're fabricating it. It's only when it does happen. If someone does break in that you have, you can now observe something real and so on. Um, but one of the things that, that, that Gavin DeBecker uh, talks about in his book is people are the only animals to rationalize our fears away. And, and I want to give a, a, a recent example of this. Um, I was giving uh, some scenario training to um, uh, some officers uh, uh, very recently, high, high stress uh, type of drills. And uh, in one of the drills, it was uh, they were being uh, challenged with uh, deadly force. We were using airsoft uh, uh, training rounds. And uh, so the officer ended up having to, to shoot an individual. In the background, we had some hecklers that were trying to uh, provoke her to this officer to go up and, and administer life-saving efforts when it wasn't safe to do so at that point in time. The officer didn't have backup, didn't have the right resources to safely make the approach. And the, the interesting thing was that this officer, you know, knew that she should not go up and make the approach. Uh, and she verbalized that she was saying, it's not safe. I'm nervous about this. Um, she, so she articulated all the reasons why she shouldn't be doing, it. you know, she shouldn't go up and, and take the gun away and start administering life-saving efforts. Um, but the problem was, is that she, she rationalized it away because this, this this drive to, to save life was so high for her. In the scenario, it worked out well. Um, the role player portraying the bad guy um, had it in his mind if, if she had made a different approach. So if she had taken this action to, to go in and save this person, um, he had made it in his mind that it would have some type of accidental discharge or potentially a shots fired um, after the fact. Uh, but it, it, it ended up working, you know, well for her and her favor. But that's that's luck. That's not skill. So recognizing that we have we as humans have have a a nature and within us to rationalize that intuition. So if you guys are doing a an inspection and your gut is telling you to you know that something isn't right, then if you have an anxiety, you have a worry. You have a concern. Those are all different levels and variants of fear. And fear is an expression of that intuition. Act on it. <clears throat> um, you know, and and one of the examples that I just you know heard uh, before we started this webinar was. Uh, some one of you was doing an, an inspection, and the they were inspecting a, a restaurant or a kitchen, and the a person had a knife, and it wasn't a, a, a dangerous situation necessarily, but it certainly provoked some anxiety. The per, the inspector was looking for uh, the exit, and the inspector had these these concerns, uh, and her intuition was telling them, "This is not right. It's not safe. It, this person isn't." Uh, they're just talking with their hands, but this knife is being waved around and it's, it's not safe. There is absolutely not, there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong in my opinion with addressing that, verbalizing it. You know, what are you doing with the knife? Can you put it down? And what's the worst can, that can happen? You know, that you make them feel bad? Well, in my opinion, that's, that's a... That's, that is a, uh, that's, that's an okay thing. You know, they should recognize that they have an instrument that can, that can harm someone. 
Um, so that's the the gift of fear uh, and uh, Gavin DeBecker with Tony Blower. Uh, he talks a lot about fear management and uh, he talks about uh, like if you're in an unsafe, unsafe situation, um, you know, trying to recognize what do the bad guys want. Um, I just was watching an update and I've heard him say this before, but it's, uh, it was a good refresher. You know, bad guys want one of three things. They, they want your property, they want you, or they want your life. Now, how that might equate to an inspection. You know, maybe they don't want your property, but they may want you. They may want to persuade you to, uh, to write your report uh, a certain way. They may want you to dismiss uh, certain observations or, or things that, certain deficiencies that need correction. Um, and are they, are they balancing, like if they do become hostile and threatening, are they balancing, you know, certain aspects of your life? Maybe they don't want to kill you, but maybe they are intent on doing physical harm to you. you know, so one of the ways to do this is to devalue yourself. Um, and it falls back into paying attention to your intuition. So you recognize, you know, when this person is being is, you know, when their intent is changing. And it looks like I've got five minutes. I could keep on going. Okay. Um, the other thing is here, uh, Tim Larkin talks about when violence is the answer. Uh, violence is a tool. You know, we, we use it just like we use um, rapport building. Uh, we use it just like when we want to be nice to someone. If, if I want to be nice to my boss because I want to raise, you know, that's a tool. Um, so I, I really like like that. And in, in talking about one of the things that Tim talks about is is giving yourself permission to, and Tony Barr does this too in his material, is giving yourself permission to use violence or take action. <clears throat> uh, in setting this up, Michelle had talked about um, you know talking about vehicle positioning, making sure we understand our exits. Uh, you know, plan ahead. And, you know, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, if, if you have a, an idea about what it is that you're walking to, you, you've done some background um, on the establishment or potentially the individual. And I would look, I would consider that, uh, you know, pre-attack use. Um, so pre-attack use is not just like a physical portrayal of, of their intent, you know, the, the boxer stance. That's kind of a classic uh the thousand yard stare when they're intent on, on potentially in my profession like a weapon grab but what, what is their questioning you know when you talk to them over the phone setting up an, an inspection um you know when they in their line of questioning and responses your line of questioning and responses you know they may be looking for your motivation uh what type of support do you have are you coming with other people um, so then also like your own strategy and there can be physical strategies and tactical strategies, but also mental and psychological, uh, physical strategies. That is your positioning, be it, you know, how you park your car for a, a quick getaway. Um, it could be how you position yourself within the, uh, within the structure, uh, looking for exits, trying to keep yourself uh, in between the you know the subject that you're dealing with and an exit, so that they're not obstructing that. Um, but mental and psychological, you know, are they looking to to build rapport to try to sweeten the pot? You know, it can lead to their motivation. Are they being overly nice? Um, you know, some of this stuff that that when I wrote this down, it's more like. Uh, 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 deal, uh, dealing with victims, but even team building, you know, in your line of work, potentially saying that, you know, they're willing to do these things and they want to work with you, you know, but all the while their physical strategy is saying something different. Um, and then of course, body language, uh, blading your, uh, if the person blades themselves, rolls up their sleeves, uh, uh, you know, taking, uh, that aggressive stance, you know, certainly definitely need to, to take action to defend yourself and, and get out of there. And the last thing 
that I want to bring up here is, is develop good habits, just like driving. Um, you know, you, you build good driving habits, you know, to develop your, your awareness and, and observation skills. Do the same thing with the situational awareness and uh, in your inspections. Do a little bit of homework, uh, plan your actions prior to the execution. Um, try not to spend time reviewing map, maps or documents or materials in questionable or potentially dangerous places. You know, that should all be done ahead of time. Um, and even if we've got multiple inspections planned for the day, uh, don't review the next, your next spot, you know, at that, you know, first the, the, the spot, the inspection site where you're at currently. Drive to a public place, a gas station, something like that, and, uh, and then review your, your documents and, and your uh, materials to anticipate what's happening at the, at the next location. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, if you're really concerned about this, think like a bad guy. Uh, one of the neat things about Gavin De Becker's book is he talks about um, how the difference between most people and the, 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 the major criminals, the uh, homicidal people and or the arsonists really is not that is not that different. I would be willing to bet at some point in, in your lives, you have wished harm on someone, but you didn't take action on it because of your, uh, you're inhibited, you're rational, you know, you understand that it's not the right thing to do. And, but there's a, there's just that fine line between that taking that course of action, you know, deviating down that, that <clears throat> potentially evil course of action versus staying on the right. So we can think like bad guys. We can start to anticipate the um, the harm that can come to us. So I guess with that, I would love to take questions. Um, and if you have feedback, please let me know um, because this is, like I said, this is a very new format for me to present. If anyone has questions at this time, you can either uh, come off of mute or uh, if, if you're brave enough, or you can also just put it in the chat and I can read it. No brave souls. <laughs> and I'm not seeing anything come up in chat either. So uh, we'll give I it was, a I was wondering if you could repeat the name of the books that um, you, Aaron, um, wrote. Well, I didn't write any of these books. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the people that I'm referencing here uh, is a guy named Tony Blower. And Tony Blower, again, he created the SPEAR system, which is an acronym for a spontaneous protection, enabling accelerate, accelerated response. He has a lot of material uh, on self-defense, situational awareness, combatives, uh, and you can find his material online. And uh, um, you can, if you're interested in his material, you can subscribe uh, to follow him. And he has a lot of a lot of good tidbits. Uh, he he's posting all the time. Uh, I, I, I get a lot of good information from him to present to the officers. Uh, as far as the books go that there's a ton of books out there uh, written by a variety of people. Uh, Gavin De Becker wrote the book, The Gift of Fear. And Tim Larkin wrote the book, When Violence is the answer. And he recognizes that and acknowledges that that violence is generally not the answer. He would be, he would probably tell you if he were here that that he would not advocate for using it. However, there are times when someone is using violence against you or, or presenting a, a violent action towards you, and there is no escape. There is nothing uh, to do except for be a victim yourself or 
uh, take a violent action. A and lot of that. Sorry, just to interrupt really quick, uh, Michelle Williams did put the names of each one of the authors um, or uh, the person that created that system. She does have them all in chat. We do have a few other questions as well. The first one being, do you offer in-person training? We do. Um, so I myself don't, uh, I'm certified through a number of companies uh, to teach to my to my own department. So commercially, I cannot, I can't teach uh, ethically to, to the public. However, the police department does do free training to the community. Um, so in Menominee, um, you know, we offer that periodically, you know, because of COVID, we kind of put the kibosh to that uh, for for this time frame. but we've, we, we want to get back into that as well. Um, I have done I have done uh, pro bono training, um, you know, to a couple different groups. It doesn't happen very often, but just ethically, it, it's not right for me to take material that other people have have created, taught me, and you know, and, and I, you know, sometimes they have a commercial aspect to their programs, um, but it's not cost effective for me to to take that avenue. Um, so yes. Jessica, um, she said that she, in her county, the law enforcement officers are always happy to accompany her at any location that she just doesn't quite feel comfortable with. Um, so reaching out to your local law enforcement uh, might be a, an additional tool that us inspectors can use as well. I would agree with that. Um, you know, we're more than happy to, uh, to do that. My only word of caution is uh, psychologically. What does that What does that give to the uh, to the per, to the proprietor, to the person, the place that you're inspecting? Um, in uh, De Becker's book, The Gift of Fear, he has a segment on how to terminate employees. It's not very long, but it has some good insight, and I could I could see it correlating um, with inspection. Uh, you know, so certainly, I mean, if it, yeah, absolutely, if you, if you want, if you need to call us, I mean, if you're in the, the Menominee Dunn County area, I have no doubt that we would be happy to, to participate or any local law enforcement agency would be willing to participate. Well, thank you, Aaron. It doesn't look like we have any other questions rolling in. <laughs> um, so, um, however, we will provide this video on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to me directly and I'll make sure that I get you the correct responses. Um, oh, we do have, Ashley has one quick question. So go ahead, Ashley. Hey, maybe it's not very quick. I just know there are a lot of social workers that are watching this. Um, and for us, it's not really realistic to use violence or combatives or things like that. So I was curious if you had any any tips on like um, like positioning yourself or things like that, if you're feeling unsafe, because there are some home visits we have to go on that we can't just leave. And I don't know that it would be beneficial to say, I feel unsafe because that could ruin rapport with um, clients. And so just curious if you have any, any kind of feedback for social workers in particular. Well, so yeah, I think one of the things, like working you know, in my own department, we're relatively small, but we do have a, a couple officers, uh, investigators who are able to go out with the social workers. And if you're walking into a situation knowingly, uh, you've got that that information and intelligence that is telling you that this is not safe. Having a plainclothes officer participate, you know, might be a really good thing. Um, and so, as far as positioning goes, one of the things that I I have seen our social workers do when I've gone on on visits with them is typically they're laden down with uh, shoulder bags sometimes even their own personal purse, uh, a backpack. And then on top of that, they're, they're typically uh, carrying a, 
you know, clipboard and notebook or multiple notebooks uh, and folders for pamphlets and information to hand out. And um, tactically, one of the things I think is, is really good is put it into everything into a, a briefcase. And maybe you already do this. So, you know, I'm not trying to insult what you already know and, and do. Um, but th I'm just commenting on what I have seen um, is keep your hands free. Uh, one of the things that Tony Barr does is, is when he talks about if someone were to attack, um, there's, a, there's a spontaneous reaction within us uh, called the uh, cross extensive reflux. And if I'm holding on to something, I'm just going to use my phone for an example. It could be a notebook, it could be uh, uh, a pamphlet and, and folder. If, if I'm holding on to that object, the tendency is to clench even harder on that object. But if my hands are free, uh, the tendency is to display the fingers, which if you actually start you know, following uh, Blower's material, he talks a lot about psychology and, and physiology. So that splaying of the fingers actually can strengthen our response. Getting your, back to your question about like positioning, anytime you have an opportunity to keep things uh, you know, close to that front door, stay in that, in that foyer area, um, you know, is in my opinion better than going deep into the into the residence. And I know as part of that inspection, you know, they're going through into the kitchen areas, they're going through into the bedroom areas. Um, you know, if they're if they're interacting with kids, they're potentially in, in basements to see what the environment is. Um, and the further you get into some of those more enclosed places and I don't need to tell you but it's it's potentially more dangerous and I guess if uh, the other thing I, I would maybe question about I mean if you're trying to develop rapport you know one of the things that that builds rapport is trust and you know being frank and honest with someone especially if you're not comfortable one can you end that contact and come back to it another day I mean if they're just having a bad day is there an option of just, you know, giving yourself an out and saying, you know, you know, I gotta, I got, you know, I have another appointment I gotta get to, and then, you know, coming back to it either later that day or a different day, um, <clears throat> when they're in a different mindset. So paying attention to where they're at, you know, going back to some of the things I talked about earlier about what is their motivation, what is their line of communication, and and that can give you insight into their uh, mindset and goals. Thank you, Aaron. That was, um, I, I hope that provided a little bit more guidance. Um, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of just staying in that foyer area. So that was kind of a, an interesting take on it. Um, so we are a little bit past our time, but obviously this was a, a good topic that people wanted to hear about too. So um, if you guys ever have any topic suggestions, please let us know because that's what we're here for. We're here to provide the topics that you want to hear. Um, and then next month will be all about algae blooms. So a completely different take on what we did today. So uh, join us next month for our next webinar. Again, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. And, and I hope it was useful, useful information. Yes, thank you.